he killed so many people that he he needed more than one storage room for the bodies like Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe and if you're old here Hello again. My name is Kate Philpott and I cover true crime cases on my channel Also, just want to say before we get into it if you're not already following me on TikTok, Instagram and Twitter then Go ahead and do so. It's all Kate Philpott underscore YT. I kind of alternate which ones I'm most active on at the moment. It is Twitter. Today's video is another requested video and it is perplexing to say the least. And gonna be honest, it does get a little intense when we get to the whole thing resolving. So I'm just gonna say that now. Listen, you're into true crime, you know this gets dark. But when I say it's perplexing, I mean it's just for the person that was responsible for these disappearances, they really didn't fit under the typical serial killer profile. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a little bit, but of course, first things first, quick little disclaimer, anything I mention in this video is just from things I found online, internet told me this <laughs> and i'm just merging it all into the one video so i do apologize if anything is inaccurate and i mean no disrespect to anybody i speak about particularly if it is inaccurate and i will just say the dates and everything when i was doing my research were all over the place so i really just kind of had to trust my gut on what made the most sense and what was being reported on most but i will just say that right now the dates were all over the place all right, grab a coffee, grab a something. And let's get into this video. All right, so this is the case of the Poughkeepsie killer. So we're gonna take it right the way back to October, 1996. And 30-year-old Wendy Myers, who was a sex worker, disappeared. She was last seen at the Valley Rest Motel in Highland. And pretty soon she was reported missing to Ulster County, New York. But I do have to preface this. Now, there, this was a pretty, dodgy, active area in the streets of downtown Poughkeepsie. There were a lot of prostitutes, a lot of drug stuff going on, a lot of violence, like even sometimes it would get to the point of shootings. So that gives you a decent image of the kind of place we're talking about here. Not saying all of Poughkeepsie is like that, but at least this particular area was not so good. And of course, Wendy Myers was not the only woman working on these streets. And unfortunately, she wasn't the only one who seemingly vanished into thin air off these streets. Only a few weeks later in November, 1996, another woman called Gina Barone was working on the streets in downtown Poughkeepsie. Apparently she was only working that night because of a heated argument with her boyfriend. So I'm curious as to whether she did this regularly or because from the descriptions, it seems that she did do this regularly, but who knows what the story was there, really. She was in her late 20s, but she wasn't reported missing until sometime in December. Allegedly, though, she was last seen on the streets having an argument with some unidentified man. Now, my mind personally went straight to the boyfriend. Like, makes sense. They had a heated argument. She went out to the streets, he followed her to, I don't know, go off on her, you know, it could be that kind of situation. But then, who knows, maybe she was just extra feisty that night because she'd had a heated argument with her boyfriend and wasn't taking any you-know-what from anyone. So, who knows? Again, this man was unidentified, so we really don't know. And this was really strange that in just a matter of weeks, two prostitutes disappeared from the same area in Poughkeepsie. But at first, the authorities really did see it as a bit of a coincidence. But this certainly was not the case. In mid-January 1997, so about a month later, 47-year-old Kathleen Hurley disappeared. She was last seen walking along the main street in downtown Poughkeepsie, but she wasn't reported missing for three days later. Until three days later. So now at this point, three women had disappeared all from the same area in Poughkeepsie. It was pretty much one every single month and this is when police really did start to get concerned. And they got to work investigating these missing person cases and they really felt that they were linked. They couldn't put their finger on what it was. Unfortunately, they really had nothing to go off. Like these women, literally just, they were there one minute and they were gone the next and nobody heard from them again. There were no leads, there was no evidence, there wasn't even a crime scene, but they did feel 
like foul play was involved. Now there was a little bit of a gap until the next disappearance which was in March of 1997 and this is when Catherine or Kathy Marsh went missing and she was 31 years old. I suppose I will also just explain that this is when she was reported missing in March 1997. She hadn't actually been seen since November 1996, four months earlier. And this obviously made it really difficult to investigate. I mean, nobody had seen this woman for months at this stage. So nobody was even, it was, she wasn't on anyone's mind. So I suppose the only thing they could really do was go and check out Kathy's apartment. But when they got there, all of Kathy's stuff was still there. Her personal belongings, her clothes, everything. So it really didn't seem like a runaway. Regardless, this is when authorities got a lot more serious about it. They checked arrest records, they rechecked arrest records, they got cadaver dogs in, held searches both in and around the city, but all of this came up with nothing. Plus there was still no evidence that a crime had even taken place. And it was around this point then that they did call in the FBI to help them investigate because almost every single month a new woman was going missing and unfortunately the FBI couldn't do a whole lot either because in order to profile a suspect they needed a crime scene or some kind of evidence or anything but they they literally had nothing to go off and women were only disappearing there hadn't been any bodies found so moving on to october 1997 this is when 27 year old michelle eason went missing she was also a prostitute in downtown poughkeepsie and was of a similar slim build and other than her skin color really did fit the same mold but she was also a mother to a young daughter and that daughter would never see her mother again after October 1997. There was a little bit more to investigate in Michelle's case though, because she was fairly involved in the drug world. She actually lived with drug dealers and there was even a rumor going around at the time of her disappearance that she had stolen drugs from somebody and that they had retaliated and either killed her themselves or got somebody else to kill her. Michelle also had a boyfriend who was questioned at the time of her disappearance. And I'm not gonna lie, this guy was saying some intense stuff. He told authorities that he believed Michelle had been killed by drug dealers and that her body had been dumped in a river, which is fairly specific. If you were theorizing something, you would say probably that her body had been dumped somewhere or in the middle of nowhere or but like in the river is i feel like that's a little too specific to be speculative they did ask him to take a polygraph test in the hopes that it would add weight to something he was saying or maybe take weight away from it but he actually refused he refused because he was apparently taking medication that could skew the results but although he's kind of suspicious he was never charged in anything in relation to michelle's disappearance they just didn't have enough to be able to charge him with anything. He was just a little, a little sketchy. But there was another rumor going around about Michelle. According to investigators, Michelle had apparently left Poughkeepsie on a number of occasions for an extended period of time. So it was possible that maybe she did that again this time. Maybe she ran away. Maybe she was sick of this life. But normally when she did this, she would contact a close friend or family member and let them know where she was pretty soon after she left. So you'd imagine that it would be pretty strange for her this time to just full on disappear and never come back, particularly because she had a young daughter there. And some people in the area were even discussing this rumor that she had gone off to live in Arizona and that's where she was still alive and, and living now. And again, that's unusually specific and I would love to know where that came from to be honest. Either way though authorities did look into this and they they couldn't really find any evidence that she was in Arizona. Like she didn't have a driver's license, credit cards, a bank account, any of that stuff so she was almost untraceable. So next thing you know in November 1997 another woman who worked on the streets of Poughkeepsie disappeared and this was 29 year old Mary Giacconi. I hope I'm saying that name right, I apologize. Interestingly though, it was actually police that reported her missing. They were the ones that initiated her missing person report, which is really strange. But the way this all happened was that her father was a retired New York City corrections officer and Mary's mother had recently passed away. So he was coming into Poughkeepsie trying to find his daughter to tell her the bad news. And obviously they hadn't been in regular contact so he needed the authorities to 
help them find her. But that's when they were like, oh, nobody's seen this girl in a while. When I say a while, I mean months. The last time Mary had been seen was in February of that year, nine months earlier. One thing's for sure though, when she was last seen, it was right around the same area that all these other women had been disappearing from. So over the coming months, police really stepped up their game. They searched the Hudson River. There were multiple helicopter searches, hundreds of interviews, but obviously there were no, there were no bodies found. There was no nothing found really. And this is almost getting ridiculous at this point because these women keep just vanishing. Nobody knows anything. Nobody saw anything. There's no crime scene. There's no evidence. There's no leads. Like but they definitely do all seem linked because all of the women up to this point, bar Michelle lived in Poughkeepsie or nearby. Several of them had previously been arrested for prostitution and were still working in that field. Most of them were Caucasian and most of them didn't have regular contact with their families. They also pretty much all had brown hair and a slim build. And the really unfortunate thing with sex work of this nature is it's pretty much a requirement to get into the car with it pretty much anyone. And let's also be real here, this had already happened six times at this point, six times. So who's to say this isn't gonna happen again? I mean, the police, I'm pretty sure they were kind of panicking at this point because from what it seemed like, there was some kind of predator just swiping women and doing God knows what with them and, and they were just vanishing. Oh, it's so strange. In hindsight, and because obviously, I know how this ends up because I've done the research on it, but I, I'm trying to put my mind into being in that place at that time and just seeing all these women disappear and not having any answers. Like it must have just been such a mind f And what added to the pressure of the case for the authorities was the fact that the public, they really, I mean, they couldn't see what effort they were putting into this investigation. They they didn't think they were putting any effort in and they had this whole perception of it that police were ignoring these missing women because they were in sex work. The police kind of had to take it on the chin because I mean, they were putting effort into this but they couldn't speak publicly about what they were doing because obviously it would have corrupted the investigation, but they were doing a lot and they were getting so much abuse for the public thinking that they weren't doing anything. In June, 1998, another woman disappeared and it was 51 year old Sandra Jean French. Same thing, disappeared off the streets. The only thing here was that her car was found abandoned in a residential area. I believe it was her daughters that found it, but still, there was no sign of a struggle, that was just that. Then in early August, a woman called Audrey Pugliese also disappeared and she was 33 years old. She was also last seen working on the streets, but the difference with Audrey was she wasn't even reported missing. She went missing, but at the time, again, nobody really noticed. And I suppose, like I said, in a lot of these cases, the women weren't always in regular contact with their family. So there weren't really people looking out for them and they were in a very potentially dangerous job, which is clearly a recipe for disaster in this case. Then on the 25th of August, 1998, Katina Newmaster disappeared. And again, was also last seen working on the streets of downtown Poughkeepsie. So there you have it. Nine different women, nine sex workers, all disappeared from Poughkeepsie in just under two years. But still, that's all they were was missing. But it wasn't long after Katina Newmaster disappeared that police arrested their prime suspect. His name was Kendall Francois, and he was charged with a single count of murder in the murder of Katina Newmaster. So what the hell, who is this guy? He was born in July, 1971. So he was a 27 year old African American man from Poughkeepsie. And he was a big old boy. He was standing at six foot four inches and he was weighing about 250 pounds or maybe even more. And when he was growing up, he led a relatively normal life. Although what I will say is from the age of five to the age of 12, he was being picked on for his size. And he did kind of keep to himself quite a lot of the time. He graduated high school in the late eighties and then joined the army. And for a while he was based at Fort Sill in Oklahoma, but then he was transferred over to Honolulu. And he was actually discharged from the army in 1992 due to his obesity. A few years later, he did go back to school and studied as a liberal arts major. He also had several jobs over the years. I suppose the one that kind of sticks out the most is he was a school hall monitor. And the only reason I say it sticks out is because of this. 
Although he had no criminal record, he hadn't done anything crazy that we know of, the kids and teachers had some weird feelings about this guy. He would play with the girl's hair and tell sex jokes. And the kids also had a nickname for him. They called him Stinky because he had such poor personal hygiene. And he lived at home with both of his parents and his younger sister. And they were kind of a middle class to lower middle class family. And the thing was, Kendall Francois had been on police's radar for quite a while, mainly because a number of prostitutes in the area had claimed that he would squeeze their necks too tight during sex. And Kendall Francois was also on the radar of basically anyone that walked past his house. The reason being this family home stank. I mean, delivery people, postmen, all of the, anybody who walked past the house or parked near the house could smell the house. Like you didn't have to be inside it to smell it or even go up to the front door. This house stank, which is uh, absolutely disgusting and really shows you the kind of hygiene level we're talking about. And I'm sure you can guess why the house smelled so bad. We'll get to that in a minute, but what he told his family was that a family of raccoons had died in the attic and he was having trouble removing their decomposing remains. So I'm sure you're probably wondering what it was that actually told them that it was Kendall Francois that was responsible for all of these disappearances. So let's get into that. By January of 1997, a number of prostitutes had complained to authorities about how rough he was and how he really held their necks too, too tight. And it got to the point where Kendall's home was put under surveillance. And one of the sex workers even allowed herself to be wired up and try and get some kind of information from him. So, you know, she, she wasn't allowed to get into his car, but she would chat to him, kind of ask questions, just try to gather some kind of useful information, but she didn't really find anything out that was significant. In November of 1997, a local prostitute called Debbie Anan escaped from Kendall's house after he attempted to strangle her. And she did report this to the authorities, but there didn't seem to be any repercussions of this. Like that was kind of the end of it. In January of 1998, police followed Kendall to the red light district of downtown Poughkeepsie. And whatever it was that gave them sketchy vibes, I'm not exactly sure on this specific scenario, but they ended up bringing him in for questioning. There was nothing that they could really arrest him on, honestly. So he was released back into the community. So just a few days later, he went out on the prowl again. And this is when he spotted a young woman called Laura Gallagher. Kendall and Laura negotiated on price and then they went off to do the deed. But during this encounter, a dispute arose about the money situation. And he ended up punching her in the face, knocking her onto the bed, and then he choked her so hard that she actually lost consciousness. She was very lucky though, she did regain her consciousness pretty quickly and she started to fight him back and she demanded that he brought her back to Main Street straight away. He obviously didn't want to, but he reluctantly agreed. And somehow word ended up getting back to the vice squad. So Laura was actually brought in for questioning. They wanted her to submit some kind of statement and she did give a statement, but she refused to sign it. And to be honest, I get it. Like. It's the kind of career path that you don't really want to be signing legal things too much, especially if this is a client of yours, it's a client of other people you know, he's a regular, he was well known among the other sex workers and among the community in general. And maybe she did have fears for her safety, which I absolutely understand. But on the 26th of February, she did eventually sign it straight away he was arrested. And the trial for this case began in May of 1998. He pleaded guilty to third degree assault and misdemeanor. And because he pleaded guilty, he only got 15 days in jail. Well, that, well, <laughs> that's what he was sentenced to, but he actually got out after seven days. And look, I'm making it sound like he was the only suspect this whole time. He wasn't. There were several suspects over the years, over, well, yeah, over the two years. Certain men were particularly rough with the girls. One man that was a suspect for a while had been arrested for a sexual assault of one of the girls, and he was looking like a pretty 
serious suspect for a while, but then they found out that he was actually in custody for the first three disappearances. And I mean, yeah, you could probably argue, well, maybe he was responsible for some of them and blah, 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 but the police really felt like this, it was just one person that was responsible for all of them. Another suspect had been previously convicted of another sexual assault and was a prime suspect in an unrelated missing person case. There was also a violent boyfriend of one of the girls who was a suspect because he also had an extensive criminal record. So you can see there, there were quite a lot of really sketchy men. A new suspect would come up and then basically be abandoned for some reason or another. In July of 1988, Kendall Francois was interviewed because authorities basically stalked out his home. They figured out his exact routine. They figured out when he got up in the morning, his routine was he would drive his mother to work and then straight away go ahead and cruise the streets of downtown Poughkeepsie. He was interviewed for several hours on this occasion and I'm not, again, I'm not sure exactly what it was that made them bring him in, but he was pretty obliging and pretty cooperative. But they did want to check out his house. So again, pretty obliging. He led one of the detectives through his house, into his bedroom, into all the rooms. And although there was nothing incriminating, this detective was absolutely floored. Floored at the state of the house. I mean, it was in an absolute dump. And it kind of turns my stomach to talk about, but I'm gonna say this real quick. There was rubbish everywhere. It smelled absolutely awful. There were maggots in the sink, soiled underwear in the kitchen, and just like the whole place stank. Like this is the house that stank from outside. like a couple of feet away, meters away. So this detective was inside the house and just like nauseous at how bad it smelled. There were syringes everywhere even, like it, it was in a bad way. But again, nothing incriminating, so he was free to go. Pendle even did a polygraph test, which surprisingly, he passed with flying colors. Anyway, there had been a task force that was put together to investigate this case. It also was not publicized, so again, they could protect the integrity of the investigation. And authorities were definitely still getting attacked by the public. And usually task forces like this are put together when there is clear evidence of foul play. But obviously that still wasn't the case here. But again, because of this, they acted on every single tip, every single lead, every single tiny little scrap of information as if it was 100% important. And a lot of the members of the task force believed that these girls had been targeted by a serial killer and the main going theory was that it was a Caucasian male serial killer. But even still, some members of the task force didn't think it was a serial killer. And I'm confused as to what they did think it was. Did they think they were all runaways? Like one runaway every single month? I'd... So a few months later while the task force was working away, there was a major break in the case, and this was in September 1998. One evening, there was an incident where detectives were patrolling the streets of downtown Poughkeepsie, and they heard a man screaming in a gas station. So one of them went in to check out what was wrong with this guy, and he basically said that a woman had just come in and claimed to have been raped and assaulted. And she had literally just left. So detectives were like, thanks dude, and they ran after the woman. He did catch up with her because she was just walking slowly away and he asked her to come down to the station and report what had happened to her. Again, she was really reluctant. She didn't want to get involved in anything legally, but she did so anyway. And when she made her statement, she admitted that she was familiar with this guy who had assaulted her. Very familiar, in fact, because he was one of her regulars and she gave them the name Kendall Francois. And authorities were already suspicious of this guy anyway. He was one of their long time suspects. So they probed a little more and got her to tell her story. That morning, Kendall Francois had picked her up in the usual spot and took her to his home at 99 Fulton Avenue. They were doing what they needed to do and afterwards she requested the money. But this is when Kendall totally flipped on her. He got really angry and started to strangle her. And like, remember this guy was, this is a big dude. So if, if he starts to strangle you, you're lucky to get away. According to her, he was crushing her throat with his massive hands. And somehow, even though this girl was only about 130 pounds, she managed to get free. Obviously an argument ensued. She was like, what the hell are you doing? But she tried to convince him to just 
Forget the whole thing happened. And she wanted him to drive her back to Main Street. <sighs> so, pretty intense stuff. Finally that day at about 4 p.m., Kendall Francois was brought in by authorities. They started questioning him and I'll get to that aspect of it in a second, but by 1 a.m., they had a warrant to search his property. So they showed up at Kendall's family home. <sighs> they served the search warrant to his mother and his sister and kicked them out of the house so that they could search. There was a whole team of crime scene processors, detectives, like loads of professionals. And I don't know what they were expecting, but this is where things get particularly intense. One place that Kendall had veered them towards in his questioning was the attic and also the crawl space in the basement. So they went to the basement first and obviously it was in the middle of the night, so it was pretty dark to the point where even with torches, it was almost impossible to see anything. But then they spotted what looked like a knee joint protruding out of a black bag and it was partially decomposed. So this was within the first hour of the search that they found the first body. Now they were under strict instructions to preserve the crime scene at all costs. Because you have to remember, this had been going on now for two whole years. These women were just disappearing and the whole time they were so frustrated because they had no crime scene. Now they had um, like eight crime scenes in one. So they decided to fully process the crime scene the following morning because there'd be daylight. I mean, this was such a huge case and they didn't want to mess it up because they couldn't see where they were going. So the next morning they arrived back at the property. Again, they searched the basement and they could now see that first body and not too far from it was another black bag that also ended up containing a collection of bones. And they actually found three bodies in that crawl space. Now, moving on to the attic. There was a bag in plain sight and when they got close enough to this bag to see inside, it became very clear that there was a skeleton of at least one person in there. And in total, there were five bodies in the attic. Five. In fact, the bodies in the attic were stored up there first and the only reason there were bodies in the crawl space at all was because the attic got too crowded with bodies. Over the course of three days, the eight bodies were removed from the house. Of course, the bodies were all in various stages of decomposition. Some very advanced and there was widespread insect activity, there was evidence of rodent activity in some cases and it was going to be pretty difficult to positively identify these bodies particularly because a lot of them had been there quite a while and i do just have to say this right this wasn't just kendall francois's home this was his family home he lived there with his mother his father and his sister and they didn't suspect a thing i have so many questions about that. I mean, obviously they must have all had really poor hygiene because like soiled underwear in the kitchen, maggots in the sink, that doesn't just happen from one person. And if it does, would they not be kicked out? I don't know. <laughs> but it really seems like they just believed that there was a dead family of raccoons in their attic and Kendall couldn't remove them. So that was that, which, <sighs> In that case, would you not like insist on trying to get some kind of professional to remove this family of raccoons that are rotting in your attic? Like, uh, I have so many questions. Anyway, authorities took four weeks to search for evidence in this house and needless to say, it was all pretty damning. The next step was to identify these women. So over time, the girls were identified as Katina Newmaster, Gina Barone, Kathy Marsh, Sandra French, Wendy Myers, Kathleen Hurley, Mary Giacone, and also Audrey Pugliese, who at this point hadn't even been reported missing, but also hadn't been seen since a month prior. Nobody was expecting her to be there though, because she wasn't even from Poughkeepsie. She was from New Rochelle, New York, which was like over an hour away, like an hour and 15, 20 minutes away. But also another question, what actually happened to these girls? Okay, we know that they worked on the streets and then they just showed up dead in some person's attic or basement, but how? 
how did this happen? And I'll admit there are varying amounts of information on each individual case, but I'll just go through what we do know. Starting with Wendy Myers, the first to go missing. Wendy got into Kendall's car and she did insist on being paid first before they did anything. But at some point though, she insisted that the sex was over. And I'm not sure if she did so prematurely or you know, if he wasn't ready to be done with the situation, but he got really mad and manually strangled her to death. He then carried her to the bathroom to wash her body before placing her into a plastic bag and putting her up in the attic. What happened to Gina Barone was she was having sex with Kendall and she said that he was too heavy and he was taken too long. So he claimed he'd been ripped off and he manually strangled her to death. And he actually killed Gina in his car in the back streets of Poughkeepsie. And then for the drive home, obviously he didn't want anyone to see her, so he shoved her down under the car seats. He then parked in his garage at the house, sorry, the family's garage at the house. And he actually left her in his car all night. The following morning then, he placed her in a black bag and he didn't actually carry her straight up to the attic, although that was where she was found. He put her under a mattress in the house. Now, I don't know, was this a mattress that was just thrown somewhere in the house? Or was this a mattress that somebody actually slept on? I honestly don't know, but I have serious chills just even thinking about that. But she was under that mattress for three whole months before he eventually moved her up to the attic. Catherine or Kathy Marsh. During Kendall's encounter with Kathy Marsh, he suddenly became very angry and he ended up squeezing her throat until her hyoid bone snapped and she fell limp. I don't know if this is true or not, but according to some reports, Kathy was also pregnant. Again, he washed her body in the bathroom and then brought her up to the attic. I'll just say there were not a lot of details on what happened to Kathleen Hurley or Mary Giacone, so I mean, they were found in his house, but there weren't really any stories there. So I'll move straight on to Sandra French. Sandra was also manually strangled by Kendall during the deed. Again, he took her to the bathroom, cleaned her body, and then brought her to the attic. But at this point, there were so many bodies in the attic, it was too crowded. Can you imagine? He, he killed so many people that he, he needed more than one storage room for the bodies. Like. So the following day, he ended up moving her down to the crawl space in the basement. He placed her remains on the floor while he dug a shallow grave down there. And then he placed her in the shallow grave and threw some loose dirt on top of her. And remember I said that Sandra French's car had been found in a residential area? Well, it turned out that where her car was found was only three blocks away from Kendall's house. And yeah, you might say, well, that's obvious. I mean, we know it was him, but when you think about it like this, right? Her car was found like three blocks away from where her body was. If it was her daughters that found her car, they were so close to where their mother was. Now, moving on to Audrey Pugliez. Kendall Francois brought her down to the basement where he had sex with her and he started to strangle her, but she managed to break free. So she ran for the door, but unfortunately he caught up with her, punched her in the face and head several times shoved her to the ground and from there he stamped on her face, ribs and stomach several times. And obviously this woman was a fighter. She started to try and rise up, like she tried to get up. He wasn't having any of it. He pushed her back down and manually strangled her to death. He then placed her next to Sandra in the crawl space. Also, I just want to say, when he brought Audrey Puglias down there to have sex with her, they were obviously right beside where Sandra's body already was. But like she was, she was buried in a shallow grave, but like, oh, oh, oh. And lastly onto Katina Newmaster. She was killed because she apparently betrayed him, but that's all we really know about her case. Let's see what this guy has to say for himself. In the interrogation room, when they were trying to get more information out of him, Kendall said some pretty intense stuff. They gave him a bunch of pictures of missing women in the area and asked him about his potential involvement in the cases. And what he did with these pictures was he put four to one side and said, yeah, I killed those. 
And then he put three to the other side and said, I'm not sure about those. Whoa. Like this guy was not even trying to deny anything. Obviously, as you know, he drew out a diagram, a map of the house that showed where the bodies were. And he claimed that he'd chosen women who knew him and trusted him. He confessed to killing all the women by strangulation, although he wasn't sure about Kathleen Hurley or Mary Giacone. And he also never admitted to killing Audrey Pugliese. Which at this point, I'm like, why even bother? <laughs> like, her body was found in your house, dude. Like, come on. What he said for all of the women that he did kill, he killed them because they had angered him in some way. Like, by ripping them off, by being rude, stealing from them, just something of that nature. So it was two days after his arrest that he was indicted for the murder of Katina Newmaster because obviously she had been the first one to be positively identified, which... Makes sense because she was the last one to go missing. And he appeared in court a few days later and pled not guilty. Anyway, it was the following month when he was charged with eight counts of murder and one count of attempted assault. And that obviously was because of the assault of Diane Franco. Diane Franco was the one who had been assaulted by him but got free and was walking away from the gas station. But under New York law, the DA had the option of pursuing the death penalty because of his first degree murder charges. But of course, <laughs> Kendall's attorney was like, okay, listen, Kendall, it's pretty clear that you're guilty. Let's not fool ourselves, big guy. So they actually made a deal with the DA that Kendall would plead guilty and then the death penalty would be off the table. On the 11th of August 2000, Kendall was formally sentenced to life in prison without parole. Specifically, eight consecutive sentences of 25 years to life for all of the murders, and then one sentence of one and a half to three years, and that was for the attempted assault of Diane Franco. What I found really, not even strange, but just like, God, this guy's a piece of work. He left the courtroom smiling. Like, what the fuck, dude? And also just another little tidbit of information. He actually contracted HIV from one of his victims, which, well, for him, brings it full circle at least. Okay, so all of that explains the eight women that were found in his house, but nine women had gone missing. Whatever happened to Michelle Eason? If you'll remember, Michelle was the African-American woman that disappeared. She'd been presumed to be linked to this case the whole time, but she wasn't in Kendall's house and her body has never been found to this day. And he was also not charged in her murder or anything in relation to her disappearance. So when they asked him about it, he denied ever being involved in her disappearance. But what was strange was he told authorities that he would never admit to being involved in Michelle Eason's disappearance because he didn't want anything to do with the murder of an African-American woman. Um, like, like my psychology brain is going with all kinds of theories and I won't get into it because it could be a whole rabbit hole, but I suppose let me know what your thoughts are on that and why, well, do you think he did have something to do with her disappearance? And then also, why would he not want to be associated with that? With, he's fine being associated with eight other murders, but just because she was African-American, he, he was more ashamed. And then going even further, like, why did he kill all these women anyway? Like, was it really just a case of he got angry in the moment because of them irritating him or, you know, ripping him off? Or like, was there internalized serious financial stress so that if he felt ripped off in any way, it was like the most insane anger he's ever felt? Or would they have been his victims anyway? And it's just, he had easier access to them because he could pay them for sex and get them alone and you know he could go and have sex with these women without them fighting back so was he also a sexual predator and he just was willing to pay for it so that he didn't have to deal with the whole fighting uh, part of it i i really don't know and the reason i'm asking these questions is because he didn't show any red flags that serial killers normally show like he wasn't abused as a child he didn't wet the bed, you know. Obviously, the house was in a state, but then how much of that was his fault? I mean, maggots in the sink. Let's also remember that he would wash the dead bodies in the sink, but then they would have just been like freshly, oh God, I'm so sorry for the 
descriptive words, but like freshly dead. So uh, I don't know. Anyway, I'm <laughs> I'm going down a rabbit hole. I apologize, but I just, it's a little bit of a weird one. He just didn't show any of those signs. Yet he went on to kill eight, maybe nine, maybe more women. The strange thing about Michelle Eason though is her case remains unsolved to this day. It's incredibly bizarre and like whether he was involved or not, she has still never been found. So either she or her remains are somewhere. Now I'm gonna sidestep for a quick sec, okay? <sighs> this is interesting to me and you know me, I like to go deep. <laughs> So remember I mentioned that Kendall Francois was in the army for a while and he transferred to Honolulu and this would have been in the eight lady, eight ladies, late 80s, late 80s, early 90s. Well, interestingly, there was a serial killer at large in Honolulu while he was there. And when I heard that fact, I was like, hmm, I have to go deep into this. I have to kind of figure this out. What if he's also responsible for those murders? Like, he hasn't been charged. So let's dive in. I'm gonna just explain the stories of each individual victim and then we can kind of have a little chat about it. The first victim was 25 year old Vicky Gail Purdy. She was a military spouse of an army helicopter pilot. Isn't that interesting? Kendall was over there in the army and this woman's husband could have easily known him. And they also lived really close to the base. Like Vicky and her husband, Gary, lived really close to the army and naval bases. So potential easy access, who knows? But on the 29th of May, she never came home from a night out clubbing with her friends. Now, when it got to the next day, her husband, Gary, was really concerned. He was expecting her home at like 9 p.m. the night before, but obviously there was no sign of her. So. He went and checked out where she had planned to park her car and he found her car and it had a new dent in it. But of course there was no sign of Vicky. And I will just say Vicky was the kind of person who was tough. She and Gary even had a bit of a turbulent relationship at times. Like <laughs> on one occasion she knocked the shit out of Gary. So like, you know, she could, she could defend herself if she needed to. But it was later that day, obviously the day after she went out clubbing, that her body was found. She was found in an embankment at Keihi Lagoon? Keihi Lagoon? Listen, I thought it was Keihi Lagoon. Apparently it's not said like that, so I'm so sorry. I don't know how to pronounce it, but she was found in a lagoon. Her hands were bound behind her back and she had been raped and strangled. Interestingly though, Gary suspected that her death was something to do with her job. And I mean, she worked in a video rental store, but they had some adult racy themed books and movies and everything as well. And only a year earlier, two women were stabbed there, which was madness. I mean, how rough was this like place? And I just, I suppose that kind of got me thinking about the potential sex work similarity with the victims from Poughkeepsie. It's not even sex work, like she literally worked in retail, they just had some sexual themes there, but I don't know, maybe I'm clutching at straws. The next victim was 17 year old Regina Sakamoto. She was still a student in school and normally she got the bus, but on the 14th of January 1986, she just never got on that bus. And she had just been talking to her boyfriend on the phone at 7.15 a.m. She disappeared and then the next day her body was also found at Keihi Lagoon. She was wearing a blue tank top and a jumper but she was unclothed from the waist down. Her hands were also bound behind her back and she had also been raped and strangled. Next was 21 year old Denise Hughes who was a secretary for a phone company but only two weeks after Regina Sakamoto's death Denise went missing and her body was found three days later by three fishermen in the Moana Lua stream and allegedly she was already badly decomposed which is really strange to me. I mean I suppose Hawaii is it's a hot warm place so that that would speed up the process but this was only two days later like i'm obviously not an expert in this kind of thing but i just that's kind of jarring to me i don't know she was found in a blue dress wrapped up in a blue tarp and her hands had also been bound behind her back and again she'd been sexually assaulted and strangled 
Then on the 26th of March, 25 year old Louise Medeiros disappeared. Now, Louise had been visiting extended family because her mother had just passed away. And on this day, on the 26th of March, she was on her way back. She was last seen getting off the plane in Oahu and she told her family that she'd get a bus home from the airport. She never got home. And just over a week later, her body was found near Waikili Stream and she was found by road workers. She was wearing a blouse, her lower body was unclothed and again, her hands were bound behind her back. Now, finally, we have Linda Pesky. Pesky? Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Linda left home on April the 29th. She was expected home late that evening anyway because she had a late work meeting, but the next morning she didn't show up to work. And I don't know if she got home or not. She did have a roommate, uh, but again, roommates may not always be hyper aware of each other's situations and schedules and stuff. But when her roommate found out that she hadn't shown up to work, she reported her missing because obviously she wasn't in their apartment all day. And also Linda's car was found abandoned on the side of a viaduct. But this is where things get a little weird in this case because a man called Howard Gay had told police that a psychic told him that a body could be found at Sand Island. So on the 3rd of May then he led the police there and they searched this particular area that he, this psychic had told him about but nothing was found there. But then they took some initiative and they searched the entirety of Sand Island. And lo and behold, she was found there. She was nude with her hands bound behind her back. So, I mean, this is a pretty consistent killer. There is a pretty specific MO that seems to be pretty much the exact same for each of the cases, you know, hands bound behind the back, sexually assaulted, strangled to death. But a task force was put together and they came up with this killer profile and they said that this was an opportunist who attacked women that were either vulnerable themselves or at vulnerable locations, like they were on their own at a bus stop or whatever the case may be. But they definitely didn't believe that it was a person that stalked their victims. They also said that he likely lives or works in the areas of the attacks, which were Waipahu or Sand Island. So what might kind of sway your mind about Kendall Francois at this point was that several witnesses had seen a light colored van and a Caucasian or mixed raced man with Linda's car. Hmm. Caucasian or mixed race. I mean, Kendall Francois was clearly African American, so could you be confused about that? Potentially, like eyewitness accounts aren't always the most accurate, but then again, who, who knows? Now, needless to say, when they discovered Linda's body, Howard Gay definitely became the prime suspect. And when they looked into him, <laughs> there were more than just this as suspicious circumstances around him. So let's dive into that. So his ex-wife and his current girlfriend both described him as a smooth talker and both of them on multiple occasions had allowed him to tie them up. This guy was into bondage and not just that, but he would have them tied up in a way where their hands were stuck behind their back, bound behind their back, you could say. And he would have sex with them while their hands were stuck that way. Interesting fact. And also on nights after they would have had some kind of fight with Howard, he would, you know, storm out of the house, disappear, and then come back and things would be normal again. But this was always on a night where the murders happened. Now, when Howard Gay was interrogated, he did actually fail a polygraph test, but that's kind of, well, that and all of the circumstantial evidence I just said, is all they kind of had against him. They had nothing to actually be able to charge him with anything. And I mean, unfortunately, he actually died in 2003 without ever being charged with any of these murders. So we may never know. A lot of people do believe that Howard Gay was responsible for the murders. And I mean, there's definitely a lot to that. <laughs> and honestly, I mean, even though this sidestep story was brought up as potentially being Kendall Francois, I mean, I personally don't believe he was responsible. They seemed to have different MOs, which in serial killer cases, as we know, like that doesn't tend to change. And I mean, yes, in the Honolulu case and also in the Poughkeepsie case, the victims were strangled to death, manually strangled. And there was also some sexual aspect to it. But 
In the Honolulu case, it was sexual assault, but then in the Poughkeepsie case, it was consensual sex, but it was only consensual because he he paid for it. I mean, yes, victims were strangled to death in both the Honolulu case and in the Poughkeepsie case, and there were definitely sexual aspects to both, but on one side you have the Honolulu Strangler who abandoned bodies out in the wilderness, and then on the other side you have Kendall Francois who literally took the bodies to his home. Well, took the women to his home, killed them there and, and kept them there. He also didn't bound his victim's hands behind their backs. Although you could argue that that was because the sex he had with them was consensual because he paid for it. So, I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Like, do you think that it was Kendall Francois or do you think it was Howard Gay or somebody fucking else? So anyway, Kendall Francois died at the age of 43 on the 11th of September, 2014. And he actually died from cancer. And that is the end of this case. So, I mean, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and comment down below what your thoughts are. I have a lot of questions about why the hell this guy became a serial killer. Like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me psychologically, I don't know. Also make sure you hit the notification bell so that you never ever miss an upload and also go ahead and join the Patreon. I have a huge, very exciting announcement. Oh my God, this is like, I'm so pumped. <sighs> huge, huge shout out to a very loyal subscriber of the channel, Queen J is now a married man. So obviously I, I've mentioned Queen J on here. He is a patron of the channel. We love Queen J. So everyone go congratulate Queen J and his new wife, Ash, in the comments. <laughs> I'm so excited for them, like living vicariously through them. <laughs> but anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.